I love France. My family and I holiday there every year. And it's just one of those places that I really connect well with. I love the, the climate. I love the countryside. I like the wine. I like the food. I like the sort of people. Did I mention the wine? But France seems to be at odds with itself in some respects because there's the sort of basic kind of cut back sort of almost sort of like rustic appeal of the little French villages and towns that you get which is completely at odds with the sort of posh luxury the sort of like, you know the higher class society that you get in places like Paris and Cannes and it's almost like it's apologizing for being posh in those places it's almost like it's kind of hiding it a little bit and this is from a country that gave us such luxury brands such as Givenchy um, Cartier, Dior, Yves Saint Laurent and it's the same when it comes to the country's cars because remember this was the country that gave us such things such as Bugatti, Delahaye, Facel Vega but latterly it almost got a bit embarrassed by it I mean slapping a bit of leather in a Reina Laguna did not a BMW rival make well, thankfully now, there's DS Automobiles, and that once kind of posh Citroen is now a standalone brand. And they want to remind us that France is capable of giving us the very, very best that they can and making us pay a premium for it. Welcome to this week's road test review. Welcome to the newly revised DS3 e tents And of course, welcome to Auto EV. <laughs> Now, before we go into this week's road test review of the new DS3 e tents it is of course that time when I'm going to ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Now, once you've done that, make sure you've pressed the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you've enjoyed it, please make sure you do give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave us your comments down below. Let us know what you think about the cars that review, such as the new DS3 e tents and of course on the Auto EV channel as a whole. Now, we've been here before with this, with the DS3, but back when we first road tested it, it was called Crossback, the DS3 Crossback, to sort of differentiate it from the DS3 hatch that had kind of gone before it, which it effectively replaced. And DS, they've kind, of, they've kind of gone through the range and kind of revised quite a lot of it, dropping the Crossback name off, well, the DS3 and the big DS7 SUV. And they've added more cars into the range, such as um, the, the, the five-door hatchback DS4 and the sort of compact kind of luxury saloon DS9 and in terms of the sales they are still quite niche I mean year to date in 2022 bear in mind I'm filming this in June they had sold just over 800 cars whereas year to date 2023 that's now well over a thousand cars so they are getting more noticed now that is still some way short of things like BMW who year to date this year have registered over 35,000 vehicles in the UK but it's more than double what Genesis have done, the luxury arm of Hyundai. So it is worth a little bit looking at the newly revised DS3 to see what they're doing and to see if actually the improvements they've made to it are making it more ooh la la than rather than ooh no thanks. But before we get started, let's take a quick snapshot of what the DS3 is all about. Well it's a small five door crossover style car that replaced the old DS3 Super Mini in the range. It comes with a choice of either petrol, or as we have here, fully electric powertrain. It now has a 54 kilowatt hour battery, allowing it a WLTP range of up to 250 miles. It's a single motor, powering the front wheels, producing 155 brake horsepower. And it's priced from £37,000 up to nearly £43,000, depending on specification which means that this is an awful lot of money for what is essentially a small five-door French hatchback. But here's the thing, going back to what I said at the start, DS Automobiles want, to, want you to see them as a premium product now. And as we know, luxury doesn't come cheap. But is it enough to convince you to spend your hard-earned cash on something like a DS3 rather than something wearing a BMW, Audi or Mercedes-Benz badge? Well, the only way that we're going to find out is by putting it through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next EV. And that is the Auto EV one. All right, styling-wise, well, they've 
kind of left well alone in going from the DS3 cross back to the new DS3. Um, LED headlights are now standard and as you can also see these daytime running lights uh, run down sort of like vertically down here. These are quite something else. I really like these and it brings it in line with the larger DS7 and the new DS4 and DS9 as well. So there's a real family face going on but it stands on its own and that's what I like about this car. There's some really nice lines on it. I love these kind of bonnet lines that come in around here and I love this sort of like little bulge as it comes down into the little kind of chromed badge there. Now depending obviously what trim level you go for will depend whether or not you get sort of like this chrome bit at the side of the grille here or whether it's blacked out that you get on the performance line and performance line plus. This particular trim is the Opera which is the top of the range one but we'll talk about trim levels and the pricing. You get the sort of little chrome uh, dots throughout the grille and of course the big prominent DS badge. No Citroen badge on it at all because I say this is a completely standalone product now. But as I say they've sort of left relatively well alone and I think that's a good thing because I think this is a really distinctive looking little car. And as you move around the side, again, there's very little sort of like to tell the new DS3 from the old DS3 crossback. Um, pretty much, as I say, they've left well alone. 18 inch wheels standard across the range and actually rides pretty well on it. It's got that slightly raised ride height for that kind of crossover style that it sort of is. But in essence, it is just a small sort of like five door family hatchback. And th those bonnet creases you can see just run up into sort of like this mirror area here which again is quite nice, very strong line here and it looks particularly nice on this metallic red car, especially in the sunlight. You get the black wheel arch extensions around the ubiquitous thing and I can't stop it doing this. Every time I walk up to it with the key it either opens itself or locks itself depending on what I'm doing. But the flush door handles as you walk up present themselves to you, they pop out and present themselves to you and then obviously they'll fold away. This is a nice line here, I like this sort of big kind of Nike tick that you get down there, that's really nice here. And rather than have the kind of window line that could go all across, you've got this kind of dorsal fin area here, which is very kind of reminiscent of what they had on the old DS3 Super Mini um, that used to rival the Mini in the Fiat 500. It had that sort of kind of little kick up there in the rear kind of window, but here obviously being a five door, you've got it there, which isn't the best thing as we'll see when it comes to sort of like the interior part of it. Obviously you can get two-tone paint, obviously you can see that here, and then I see there's some nice little details around it, like the little DS logo embroidered into, sort of like, well, embroidered, stamped into sort of like the rear kind of light area here, which is quite nice. And a nice kind of big roof spoil and a shark fin aerial as well. So yeah, distinctive, good looking little car. And again, around the rear, the only real change is this here, the DS Automobiles badging along the back there on this plinth. Do they do like a badge, don't they? Because there's another DS badge there. There's the e tense badge there too. It's the electric one and the DS3 model designation. So we've got four badges going on in a very small space. I'm not sure they're all necessarily needed, but there you go. Um, high level brake light um, tucked up into the spoiler there. Rear wiper, good, well done. Um, the only bit I don't really like, whilst I do like these kind of kind of slightly swollen kind of arches, you've got these fake kind of vent bits in here and I always find that a bit incongruous. I'm sure there'd been a better way to, to do that, but anyway, there we go. Um, the other thing that's not ideal about it is the boot release is underneath above the number plate there. So you can do it off the key and also do it from there, but it does mean obviously if you get the car a bit dirty, your hands are getting a bit mucky there, but you can do it off the key at least. But it might be nice to maybe do see something and do a button on the wiper or a little button up here or the DS badge even be the boot release, but there you go. And what else you got? Well, you got the fog light mounted right down at the bottom there, and obviously a couple of reflectors either side, and then that's really about it. But as I say, on the whole, overall, I really like the look of this car. I think it's quite, it cuts quite a dash, and it has, it turns a few heads, you know. Well, I've had the car now for a while, I've been driving around it locally, I've done a couple of long journeys in the car, and people are sort of looking at it going, wow, that is quite nice, especially in this metallic red colour. And I have to say, the paint finish is pretty decent on it as well. So they're certainly adding up to sort of like give the impression of being a very premium car brand with the car. But what do you think? Good enough? Or do you just see it as a small, cheap French hatchback? As always, let us know in the comments down below. Now, boot space remains as is from before. So 350 litres. And it's sort of here that you start to realise the sort of market segment that DS are sort of playing in, in some respects, because despite the price, this is way down on things like, let's say, a base model scored Enyaq or an MG ZS or, you know, cars such as the BYD Atto 3 and stuff. But it's way bigger than the small sort of like 
exclusive kind of mini, sort of the mini electric or the Honda E or the Fiat 500E. So it's a good size of boot for the size of car it is in some respects. But the downside obviously with not being on a bespoke EV platform is there's no cable storage um, underneath here. So there's just your tools and then that's it. Um, you, if you want to carry around your, your Type 2 cable, you got to carry it in this bag. However, 350 litres, well it's not going to get four suitcases in, but you can get three in. So there's our medium one, which goes up at the back there. We get a carry-on, which sits down in there, and then another carry-on, which goes there. And as you can see, there's plenty enough room there for either rucksacks or that cable bag to go back in there. So it's not bad, as I say, we're only just missing out on the big suitcase. So three suitcases, plus some soft luggage, would certainly fit into the back of the car quite easily. Um, you can add the practicality, you can increase that by split folding the rear seat folds in a 60-40 split and that will obviously increase the space up if you don't have any passengers but there's no load through facilities, you want to carry a longer load you've got to drop at least one side of the rear seats down and of course not being on a bespoke EV platform means you also don't have any storage up at the front you don't even get the gas strut dampers, you've got an old fashioned bonnet stay as well not that there's anything really to look at in there. In fact, actually, that looks a lot like a petrol engine that's in there. So there you go. But that's what you've got. Right. The other issue is rear seat space. Now, that's the driver's seat set up for me. And as we all know, I'm five foot seven, maybe five foot eight. And, well, yeah, I mean, that's it, it's starting to encroach a little bit. Certainly if you're six foot, there's no way a six foot passenger could sit behind me. Obviously, you need to possibly put these head restraints up as well, otherwise they dig into the, your shoulder blades. But kind of once you're in, you're in. But yeah, it's not massive back here at all. There's certainly no flat floor either. You've got a hump in the middle there. So, you know, you are really kind of limited down to sort of like two seats either side there's no way anybody would be comfortable not even a child i don't think in the center seat here and um, there's also a lack of connectivity back here there's no usb ports at all to charge up ipads or stuff like and the map pockets are all right they're just these kind of you know material bit there the door bins yeah they're all right will they take a water bottle let's have a look no oh no they will they'll take they'll just take my water bottle um, and that's about it. Isofix points, yep, they're here, but you've got to unzip these little bits here to then lift the cushion up to get into them. So it's not ideal either. Now, here's what I was saying earlier about the styling bit. That dorsal fin that comes up here, it really does encroach into the glass area. So it makes it even feel even more enclosed than when you're in the back of the car. Especially if you were a child, you know, and you were kind of sitting slightly lower than I would be, even on a booster seat. So that's going to make you feel really quite hemmed in. And I'd quite like to have seen them maybe do something like even an option of a panoramic roof, or even like they used to do an old DS3 Cabriolet. You know, it's so like maybe a kind of rollback canvas thing that could maybe just let a bit more air and a bit more light in. But they don't do that. Everything's well appointed. That's the one thing I will say. And we'll see that in the front, you know, when we go into the front, you know, you get the nice kind of embossed DS logo on the backs of the, the head restraints and, you know, the materials, you know, the kind of soft touch on the door handles and such like. But yeah, this isn't really a car you're going to buy for practicality reasons, in fairness. Now, up front is where things start to get a whole lot better, in my opinion. I really like the design of this interior. It's very quirky, it's very French, it's the sort of style that DS have started to become very renowned for, you know, diamond shapes. Now, not everyone's going to like it, and I get that, you know, so, so I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, it's the best interior ever, because I get that other people will not like this. But I like it, it's quirky, it's like the outside, and there's been some improvements. Um, up here as well. So now all models get this 10.3 uh, inch uh, infotainment screen here, uh, which has a wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard. So that's across all models as well. The navigation, the, the, the default navigation or the in-house navigation is by TomTom. Tom. Um, so, you know, it's pretty decent. The screen's quite quick to respond. Um, you know, you can go into it. There's various different other little bits and pieces that you can do when you're in here. Um, so you can go into your settings menu. 
and you can change your climate up here as well. Um, so although there's sort of some shortcut buttons to take you straight to the climate here, you can do it here so you can change the airflow wherever you want it to go, your fan speed, your temperature. You can set your preconditioning as well, um, which you can also do via the MyDX app, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so that's available here. As I say, you can go into various different bits and pieces, obviously depending what you want. So navigation, and then there's all these tiles um, to go through here. So media navigation, your advanced driver assistance systems, uh, lane keep assist, which is in here. I don't know if I get it how you go home on that one. That's it there. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few little bits and pieces there. And the screen itself is nice and clear. It's up in your line of sight. Um, I, I get on quite well with this, I have to say, Jay. Now, the other thing you get is a head-up display, depending, obviously, on the model, this Opera model, which, again, yeah, it, it is in your line of sight, and it's really nice and easy to, sort of like, to, to find. You can also adjust, if I think down here, there's a little um, button down by my right knee where you can actually adjust the sort of like the, the oh, sorry you can adjust the angle of it as well, um, which is quite decent as well. So you can play around with that and you get a nice view from that. Going into the driver's binnacle, however, I, it's okay. I just wish it was a bit more configurable. Um, you know, it's got your speed there, which is everything's nice and easy to read. All the information's dead easy to read. So the speed. Um, your gear display, uh, whether you're, you know, it's on power mode or charge, you know, on, on brake regen mode, um, your distance, your state of charge, and your distance to goes down there. You can all read very, very easily. But in the centre, you've got this, this, this image of this sort of like car where it shows you where the power's going to. I'd quite like that to be able to be changed, and I've had a play around with it, and I don't think you can. You can't change it, you know, so maybe to be able to display your media here when you've got navigation up there would be quite nice, or or vice versa, to have a map in there um, rather than just up there as well. So I feel that's a bit of a wasted opportunity with that bit there. Anyway, the rest of it, as I say, the buttons here that you get, they're touch sensitive. So when you press them, um, it just happens. There's no click to tell you that's what you're doing. Um, which would have been nice, you know, they'd be nice if they'd been capacitive buttons and just give you a little bit of feedback. Um, but once you, t they're quick to respond. Um, but as I say, I always quite like to have a little bit of feedback so you know you've actually touched the button, but they don't have any of that. Um, and then there's some ancillary ones down here, so volume um, for your radio, for your audio here. Um, heated, fr well, sorry, def maximum defrost front screen there. Um, heated rear screen. Um, switching the, the temperature off or recirculation there and then obviously you get the two kind of face vents there so again it's all nice and it looks nice and it works there could just have been a little bit more thought maybe put into it um, you've got a wireless charging pad here for your mobile which is nice and handy especially with the wireless uh, CarPlay and Android Auto you've got connectivity with through a USB-C port there anyway um, and you've got these metallized um, kind of buttons down here so you've got your electronic part brake your drive mode button there and then your four electric window switches um, plus your sort of like lock and unlock um, and your sort of like you know cancelling out the back rear windows for the kids there so there's no controls on the door it's all down here your mirror switch is the same it's tucked away by your right knee so ergonomics haven't really been sort of like the key thought here it's all been about style and as I say, I don't have a problem with that. I do like it. It just takes a little while getting used to where everything is. What can't be denied, however, is the comfort. Now, I'll talk a bit more when I'm driving the car, but the comfort of this car is sensational, as you'd expect from a brand that was sort of like spun from Citroen. The seats themselves, they're just right in terms of they've got the right amount of support, or I find they've got the right amount of support for me. Um, they're just long enough in the squab. There is a slightly longer squab, squab on them, so they do support underneath your knees. There's dr electric assistance on the driver's side, but not on the passenger side, which is a bit disappointing. And a little bit like the smart hashtag one I drove last week, I'd just like to have seen her be able to tilt the seat a little bit more than I can on the driver's side, but there we go. But I can't deny the actual comfort of the seat themselves. They've also got massage function on this particular model, um, you know, on the driver's side, which is nice to have if you like that kind of thing. Um, so you've got that there. 
the wheel the wheel adjusts exactly expected to do so it's reaching for rake and again it's manual but you get a nice driving position the wheel itself is a nice size it's just the right kind of diameter it's got a nice guff around it slightly flat at the bottom and they've got physical controls on the, the steering wheel itself so again volume on the right you know it's an actual physical button same for your phone and then the rocker switches for moving your track selection or your cruise control buttons which are on the left side so really nicely laid out re everything and everything feels quite quality you know nothing feels cheap in here which is the one thing i will say where they've made massive improvements towards all the materials on the inside of this car are absolutely top notch this leather is the softest leather i mean it's it's napa um, when you get the, you know, you get up here, they do the Napa leather on the dashboard here. But this watch strap leather that's on this Opera model is beautifully soft, and it's got a really nice texture to it, and it just, it just feels special, which is good considering the price of the car. You know, this is the point I was trying to make. Yes, it's a small car, and yes, maybe you would look at it as a rival for things such as Peugeot, um, you know, the Smart, and maybe some Kia and Hyundai's. But DS Automobiles, I don't think, want you to see it like that. They want you to think of it as a premium brand. And part of the way they're doing that is by making the materials inside the car feel really, really premium. And it has worked. It feels lovely in here. All the buttons, apart from this sort of pistol grip um, gear selector, which you see in other cars um, within the Stellantis group and the column stocks, it's all sort of bespoke DS. This, this isn't shared, this panel isn't shared with anything else. Um, so, as I say, the materials that they've got on here, there's four trim lines, and even on the basic trim, it's Alcantara on the seats. So, again, you know, there's an element of them that they've, even on the basic car, as expensive as it is, they've made it feel quite special inside. There's obviously some slightly harder plastics, you can lower down area here, which is fine by me, but it all feels really well built. Everything feels solid. You know, there's not been a squeak or a rattle from the car since I've had it. And I've done a few fair few miles in this car now, and it's been excellent in terms of that. Um, storage, yeah, okay, good, you've, good storage. You've got two cup holders here, so I can get my coffee flask and my water bottle in there. The door bins are big enough for my sunglasses case. They're not lined with kind of cheap plastic, but they're not actually lined anyway. It'd be nice to see maybe a bit of rubber lining at the bottom, as I say, stop things rattling around. Uh, there's a glove box which is not even worth talking about because obviously it's got to clear a fuse box I would suggest on right hand drive cars and that is just woefully inadequate so much so the handbooks have to sit in the boot and um, so that's pretty poor but there's a centre cubby box in here which is quite deep for all your other little bits and pieces like your Mars bars or whatever that can go in there 12 volt socket at the back here and another USB port here for connectivity um, the driving position, as I say, is lovely. The seats are really nice. There's a huge amount of comfort in this car and everything kind of falls to uh, hand quite easily. Yes, you can maybe argue the screen is a tiny bit of a stretch away, but I'd, I haven't found that um, for what I'm using it for. And there is also voice activation as well. So if you're using your Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, you can use your Siri um, to, to activate so like, you know, your Spotify or whatever, um, and which is pretty good or make calls. So it's not the end of the world. So... Um, summary, um, yeah, it feels special. That's the one thing you will take away from in here. It feels really high class in here. The materials used are superb. The build quality is excellent. There's a couple of little niggles which I would like to have seen change, such as being able to configure that screen and maybe have these as capacitive buttons where they will click once you've touched them. But on the whole, I got on well with it. I have to say, I really like it. Now, the other change for the DS3 is battery size, which is now a 54 kilowatt hour battery. Now that's the gross capacity. I think usable capacity is just a shade under 51 kilowatt hours. Now that has increased the WLTP range that you should get out of the car. And uh, DS Automobile say you should get up to 250 miles out of it. And they've also increased efficiency and certain things by changing the motor slightly. Now in fairness, as I say, I've been using the car a lot this week and I've done a couple of really big journeys in it. And I've seen some pretty decent efficiency figures so you're certainly up well above 200 miles uh, range out of this car um, I mean okay it's warm at the moment and it's hot I'm sure in winter that will maybe drop a little bit but I still think you'll be well over 200 miles that you would see out of the DS3 from now
Now, your charging speeds are the same, 100 kilowatts they're pegged at, which means um, if you're going from 10 to 80%, the usual benchmark, if you get a charge that's capable of delivering 100 kilowatts, you will top it up in half an hour easily, no problem at all. And if you're charging from your home wall box and it's a seven kilowatt wall box, um, then you're gonna be going from flat to full in around about seven and a half hours. Now, as well as changes to battery, uh, there's a small change to the power output. It's gone up to 155 brake horsepower, up from 136 um, in the previous car. Oddly enough though, it doesn't make it feel that quicker, if at all, to be honest with you. I mean, 60 comes past in a re relatively leisurely nine seconds from rest, you know, which is probably what you'd expect from, you know, a car like this, but yeah, it's not, it doesn't feel fast and that's, in some respects a good thing because if you try to hurry the DS3 that's when it kind of falls apart a little bit it just doesn't feel like a car that wants to really be taken by the scruff of the neck and thrown around the steering's very light I wouldn't say it's vague um, but it is light it's not the most communicative uh, steering rack I've ever felt what it does mean however is it's very maneuverable so, you know, around about town, if you're using the car around about uh, the town or the city, you know, or smaller kind of country lanes where you've got a lot of kind of switch backwards and forwards, it, it is very easy to manoeuvre the car. It feels very light and it feels very easy um, to change lanes and to get it into little gaps and stuff. Um, talking of which, visibility, well, visibility is okay. Um, that bit in the back, that kind of dorsal fin on the back door, you don't notice. Um, from the driver's seat really at all so visibility is fairly good um, you get relatively big door mirrors and there's blind spot monitoring as well there is a lot of safety systems on the car well I say a lot I mean there's some cars have more there's, there's enough so there's lane departure there's blind spot monitoring and obviously there's the distance guidance cruise control as well um, let's just chat about the brakes because if you watched last week's uh, smart road test I said oh I've been driving the new DS3 and the, the brakes seem a lot better I don't know what I was talking about I think I must have been on I don't know I was maybe still hung over or something I don't know because actually they're not I did think they were at first but no they're not any better and it's always been my bugbear with these Stellantis group cars is the braking on them because what you have is a sort of a deadness at the top of the pedal and what it feels like it feels like as you start to brake it's using the motor but then there's a step where it's then the friction brakes come in that's how it feels and it's very I find it very difficult to modulate the braking on the cars um, now oddly enough I had an E2008 Peugeot the week before this and next week I've got a Corsa again so again it'll be interesting to see if the Corsa is still the same as it was you do have brake regeneration, but it's one stage, and it's again the same as it's always been. You just bring this pistol grip lever back from D into B, um, and then you get this very kind of light brake regen. It's all right. It's never going to be one pedal driving, though, in these cars, so don't expect it to be. Um, so if you want one pedal driving in, in your EV, then you need to look elsewhere, because you certainly won't get it in this car. Um, what else is there to say? Right, the big thing for me, however, with this car is, is the refinement. I think that DS have spent a huge amount of effort, and, and the old car wasn't exactly a noisy place to be, but I think they've put even more sound deadening into it and did I suggest a bit more refinement into the, the drivetrain and the chassis, because this feels really, really premium. It feels really plush. It's a really comfortable little car. You can tell that there's a spin-off from Citroen. The suspension, first of all, whilst not floaty and, and light like a Citroen EC4, has got a compliancy to it that's lacking in things like the E2008, uh, you know, and some of the other cars that you might consider in this one, like the BYD Auto 3 and the MG ZS. It's not a magic carpet ride, as I say, it's not Citroen-esque, but there is something about the ride quality that's really nice about it. It doesn't crash through undulations, it doesn't float, it just sort of keeps on going, and... That guy was a bit close. It doesn't kind of keep on going, it just 
it, yeah, it just levels things out a little bit, and it's really very nice. Um, and as I say, the, the, the second part of that is the noise level, or lack of. It's, it takes a lot of the harshness of the surface of the road um, and some of the suspension bump thump that you might expect on some harsher surfaces and just keeps them well out of the cabin. It's almost Lexus-like. You know, though the Lexus UX300E, there wasn't a huge amount about that car I, I was much in favour for, but its refinement was off the scale. This is, this is good. This is like that. It feels really nice in here. You know, and I've done quite, you know, quite a bit of driving in this car. I've done a couple of big motorway drives in it. Um, and yeah, different surfaces. It doesn't make any odds. It's a really pleasant place to be. And then the other upshot of that is the seats. As I was saying earlier in the interior, the seats are, are, are sublime. They've just got the right amount of, of, of grip in terms of holding you in place. You don't tend to slide about on the leather. They've got nice lateral support. There's just enough support under the thigh as well, the way they're sitting. And the cushions just feel right. It just seems to hold you in the right places. I'm really impressed by it. It's the one thing that I would say to you, if you judge the car on paper, there'll be a lot where you think, oh, that doesn't sound like it's, it's going to be good. Go and drive it, because I tell you what, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised how this drives. It's a really nice little car. Sorry, went through restriction. Um, it's really refined. It feels properly plush. It feels properly premium, which is exactly what I think that they're trying to do with the car. Um, what else is... The, right, so you get different drive modes as well. There's a little button here, drive mode. And, of course, it's the usual suspects, you know, eco... Um, where everything just dulls down, you know, you're trying to get the last of the, you know, the last bit of mileage out of the battery. I never really bother with those, if I'm honest with you. Although in saying that, I drove the Smart the other day and the Smart was quite nice and equal. Um, then you go normal, which is obviously the kind of default setting. Um, what everything's fine, you know, you've got a nice kind of, a nice response from the throttle. As I say, the, the brakes are what they are. They're never going to be um, the last word and feel and as I say that I'm really always been disappointed by these if you flick it into sport mode now you can feel the extra bit of grunt you can feel the extra little bit of, of performance everything starts to glow a bit red on the dashboard and stuff and as I say that's when maybe things fall apart a little bit where you try and really throw the car around it just doesn't work it's not a car that really feels comfortable in that kind of scenario um, and I don't know it's a bit like asking me to jog I can do it I just don't really want to it's not my comfort zone I'd rather just walk so yeah in terms of the way that the DS3 drives there is the improvements over the last car and the last car was good but the big one for me is the refinement it's a really pleasant quiet place to be um, and as I say the, the way that it deals with imperfections on the outside whether it's wind noise road surface anything like that they've worked hard on that i think and you can really you can appreciate it this is a really really nice little car in terms of the way it feels if you don't want something sporty if you don't need extra space if you just want you know if it's maybe just for you and you don't mind spending the money it kind of makes sense. I kind of get it. You've got to you've got to judge the car on its own merit. You can't judge it um, against other cars at this price point. You've got to really kind of want it. It will be a very niche product, the DS3. It will be a very niche car for people. But if it's if you drive it and you like it, you really will appreciate living with it. Because I like this. I think this is a nice little car. Now, the one word that I've been using really throughout this road test review has been premium. And when it comes to price, you are going to be paying a premium. So, you've basically got four trim levels in the range. There's the performance line, which kicks the range off at £37,200. Uh, then you move up to the performance line plus, 
and that's £39,145. And as I say, they are pretty much what the name suggests, the sort of sportier kind of looking cars, you need Alcantara instead of leather, um, you know, there's not chrome on the car, the kind of blacked out anodized kind of chrome, um, rather than the sort of the bright work that you get on this car. You then move to the Rivoli at 39,700 where it's more kind of luxury orientated and that gets leather with the option of cloth if you want or there's this one the opera the top of the range car which comes in at 42,700 pounds this particular car that I've got here with the metallic paint is 43,675 and these prices obviously are correct at time of filming so as I say it's not what you'd call a cheap car the other things is running costs. Now, the DS automobile warranty is just three years, whereas obviously you get things like MG, Hyundai and Kia, which are now coming out with sort of five years, even seven year warranties. Yes, your battery's got the usual eight year warranty that you expect from most manufacturers, but in terms of mechanical warranty, it is just a three year one. The other cost that you do have to factor into all of this as well when you're looking at the DS3 is depreciation. Now, when we first road tested this car, which was just about three years ago now, um, I was looking on a certain used car website beginning with an A um, at what that car would cost now, you know, the sort of original test car, and it was the Prestige model, which is the equivalent of this Opera, um, so it was top of the range at the time. You can pick one of those up less than three years old with less than 20,000 miles now for £17,000 from a main dealer. That's a huge amount of depreciation on a £43,000 car after less than three years. So it is a factor that you're going to, a cost, sorry, you're going to have to factor into it if you're looking at one of these. And in terms of competition, well, it's tricky because if you view this as just a small sort of electric family crossover, you're going to be looking at cars such as the Peugeot E 2008 and the Vauxhall Mark E. Obviously it's stable mates from within the Stellantis group. Um, you might also be looking at things like the Kia Niro at this sort of price tag, um, Hyundai's new Kona, the MG ZS, the BYD Atto 3 and of course the car that we tested last week, the new Smart Hashtag 1. And if you view it against those cars, then all you're going to do is highlight the weaknesses of the DS3. DS automobiles want you to see it as not being really a competitor for cars like that. They want you to see it as being sort of like a very small, very luxurious EV. So maybe it's cars such as the Mini Electric, uh, the Honda E, um, you know, maybe even the Fiat 500, where of course, yes, it's still more expensive than those, but it is a bigger car. So maybe it's more that kind of prestigious sort of, sort of like badges, those more kind of quirky kind of left field choices that you might be looking at that we will see as maybe a rival for the DS3. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new DS3 E10s. We like its styling, the interior design, its comfort, its refinement and the fact that it is a little bit different. We don't like well, the brakes still aren't the best. It's very cramped in the rear. It's price. And there is also the factor of high depreciation. Delivering a verdict on DS3 will be more about delivering a verdict on DS automobiles as a brand in some respects. Let me explain. If you view this car objectively, against other cars that you might consider its rivals, the MG ZS, the BYD Atto 3, the Kia Niro, cars such as that, then this makes no sense what at all. It just doesn't cut it. It's not big enough. Um, it, you know, its depreciation is huge. It's too expensive. However, if you remove it from that equation, if you remove it from sort of like the, 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 the thought process of judging it against those other rivals, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, bear with me on this. A couple of weeks ago, I drove the DS4, their hatchback. It's a hybrid, so we won't feature it in Auto EV, but I managed to get my hands on one and I was driving it. And it's a car that would compete with things like the BMW 1 Series, the Audi A3, the Mercedes A-Class, Volkswagen Golf. And when I was driving it, I could think to myself, it feels different, it feels a bit more special. There's something about it that would make me choose this over those other cars that I've just mentioned. It's maybe a little bit how we used to view brands such as Saab, um, uh, Alfa Romeo. They were a bit more of a left field choice. And that's kind of where I'm thinking, 
DS Automobiles fits in. As I say, think of it as a rival for Genesis from Hyundai, as Lexus from Toyota, and it all starts to make sense. There's a lot to recommend this car. They've done a huge amount to it since we last road tested it. It's still comfortable, but it's beautifully appointed inside. The range is good on the car now, and it is efficient, and it's just a nice little car to drive. But, as I say, you've got to view it solely as this car, because if you don't, and you view it against other cars, that's where you'll struggle with it. Remove them from the equation, and actually, there's a lot to like about this car. Thank you for watching yet another episode of Auto EV. As always, please remember to make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Then once you've done that, press the bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. Once you've watched the videos, if you do enjoy it, if you have enjoyed this one, make sure you give it a thumbs up as well. And please remember to leave us your comments down below. What do you think of the new DS3? Am I just going mad? Is it too expensive? Is it a car you would consider? Do you have one of the old cars? Tell me what your thoughts are on it. How have you been getting on with it? Let us know in the comments down below. Now remember, we're also across all social media platforms as well. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, TikTok even, we're all there now as well. So give us a follow there too, because that helps the channel as well. And if you've still not had enough of us, then make sure you stay on the YouTube channel now because there's hundreds of videos there, not just road test reviews, but used car reviews, twin tests, van reviews, even motorbike reviews as well for you to get your teeth into. All it means for me to say is thank you once again for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to support the channel. And I'll see you again soon.